Another weekend of League One action has passed. It's time we break down all of the details that you might have missed. Let's go. As always, if you do find value from the content, please make sure you leave a like and subscribe. I can tell you over 70% of the people that watch this podcast on a regular basis haven't yet subscribed. Please make sure you do it. It's free to do so, and it helps me grow and expand my audience. Let's begin with the first game at Bolton Wanderers as they hosted Portsmouth, who had a chance of promotion and, of course, the league title. It finishes Bolton 1, Portsmouth 1, the XG 1.83 to 0.26. From a Bolton perspective first, coming away slightly frustrated with just a point against the eventual champions, I think probably outlines the fundamentals of that Bolton display. It was nearly there, but at this stage in the season against this type of opposition, that is often not quite enough. It, if a game or season was won on quality between boxes, Bolton would have had this campaign done and dusted months ago, but you still feel that inconsistency in conversion and very slight frailty defensively. Of course, from a wider perspective, Bolton's top two hopes are no longer in their hands, but their task is clear. Win every game and hope Derby slip or take a fantastic run into the playoff campaign. As for Pompey, it wasn't the promotion party they were hoping for, but the inevitable draws closer. Just a point on Tuesday night against Barnsley will secure their position in the championship next season. On yesterday's game alone, it was quite unusual really. It felt like the majority of their energy went into their structure in a defensive shape instead of their usual front-footed approach going forward. But as the old football saying goes, if you can't win, make sure you don't lose. And well, Pompey, they stuck to that and they did come away with a very, very important point. Take a look at the graph in front of you, brought to you by SofaScore. The graph does reinforce Bolton's control. Pompey started the game the strongest, but after that, it looked like one-way traffic in the home side's favour. I do want to draw your attention to the height of the bars. There might be plenty of green, but there are large spells where Bolton clearly have the ball, but are struggling to create clear-cut openings. And in that case, you credit the diligent Pompey work without the ball. John Massinio's side defended their way to a point on the road. It wasn't the most attractive and actually felt quite old school at times, but it did work. The away side made 29 clearances, 13 interceptions and 14 tackles. Pompey's back line alone were involved in 35 defensive actions. I think this screenshot probably outlines the intentions of both teams throughout the entire 90 minutes. In this screenshot alone, Pompey are defending with eight outfield players, potentially nine because Ogilvy could be out of shot. But we've got Rafferty, we've got Pack. We've got Lang, Kamara, Moxon, Paddy Lane, Rafferty, Shocknessy, and like I said, maybe Ogilvy at fullback who isn't in this image. Now, Pompey's average positions, I think, show both their work defensively, but also their intentions in transition. With Kamara being the highest Pompey player, it became very clear he was the direct outboard on the turnover. The away side attempted 66 long balls, only completing 189 passes, 178 less than their average per 90. Although he had the least number of touches of any outfield player to play in 90 minutes, he attempted the most Pompey dribbles and accumulated their only shot on target. It was direct, it wasn't always effective, but as I said in the preview, just one Kamara move can lead to a problem. He goes 1v1 and forces Bolton to react. As game plans go, bar one moment, and when we've looked at the screenshot and looked at the goal coming from Kamara, you know, Pompey got it right and defended very well for large spells. Now, as we said in the preview, season state is really important and the bottom line was Bolton had to win this game and they did have the chances to do it. As shown with the screenshot earlier and in the preview this week, Bolton attack with numbers. They commit plenty of bodies in the attacking zones and as the average positions show, only two Bolton outfield players average the position in their own half with Bolton operating with a quite front-footed 3-5-2 in possession. As we've said time and time again on this show, Bolton a lot of the time are nearly there. It's the final touch, the final conversion, because everything about their build-up and the way that they approach football matches on the eye and statistically is wonderful. But they've just got to find a way of winning this game and 
they don't. As the croaky voice suggests on this Sunday afternoon, Oxford 5, Peterborough 0. The XG 2.96 to 1.97. Just wonderful. So many talking points. So much to dissect. I thought Oxford were total perfection. No season outcome is achieved from this result alone. But something has clicked in recent weeks against one of the best sides in the division. It all fell into place. Oxford now have a three-point cushion inside the top six, facing Lincoln on Tuesday that have to win. Our fate can all but mathematically be confirmed with a win against the Imps. As for Peterborough, a humbling result, a terrible performance, potentially a delayed hangover from Wembley last weekend, but an afternoon that definitely should be forgotten. A shaky, quite lackadaisical approach with the ball and with so much naivety and sloppiness defensively, you combine both of those aspects and the scoreline could have been even worse. For me, the graph reflects Buckham's game plan perfectly. Concede the ball, press aggressively, transition quickly and take the chances. Oxford were at total ease with Posh having the ball. With 30% possession, the home side bettered their expected goals, big chances created, shots on target and of course, just actual goals. The game plan was utter brilliance and the execution was total perfection. Now this screenshot highlights Oxford's shape out of possession, operating as quite a low block in a 4-5-1. You've got four here, You've got five across the middle here. Harris, by the way, operating as the lowest midfielder, who is, of course, the striker. And Ruben playing as the striker at this moment in time. We're soaking up pressure behind the ball, but also looking to press and looking at the right time to press and move up field. Now, this next screenshot is 14 seconds later. The posh have been dispossessed and Oxford have four players inside the opposition box. Of course, the goal is scored by Ruben from a cutback from Josh Murphy, who's carried the ball upfield, but it's about how quickly this is done. 14 seconds from the last screenshot, which does show Oxford being very, very diligent out of possession, to being able to have four players inside Peterborough's penalty area. When we speak about speed, energy, and total tactical clarity, this is what we mean. That move there, the speed of that 14 second move is no accident. It's well-timed, it's positively aggressive, and it kills the opposition. They just didn't know how to deal with it. Oxford's low block is also visualized when looking at their average positions. It's a fairly deep line with a limited number of Oxford players averaging a spot in the opposition half. It was Peterborough who could just not comprehend how quickly Oxford went from being so structured to having four or five players inside the attacking zones within seconds. Josh Murphy remains to be one of my favorite Oxford players to watch in recent years, whilst Josh McEachran dictated the middle, winning the ball back and being a crucial cog in getting the ball in the crucial areas at speed, just as if Cameron Brannigan was there. Now, this identity isn't just about technical ability, but also about running for days. Ruben spoke about his role as almost a box-to-box -box midfielder. Goodrum and Murphy, the same. It requires so much running. But the visual work rate of Owen Dale is an absolute joke. Just look at the ground he covers down that right-hand side. Without the ball, he's an aggressive wing-back type, and with it, he's a bombing winger. It's a piece of recruitment that won't get spoken about enough, but we now know what does Buckingham sides look like. He was a must-buy. He is a workaholic and a crucial player in the way that Buckingham wants to take down an opposition. And Oxford, well, they took down Peterborough in style. At Pride Park, it finishes Derby 3, Leighton Orient nil. the XG 1.36 to 0.36. Derby County highlight the weaknesses of their opposition and play to their strengths. That's the poor worn way. A much needed win that now ensures their fate is in their hands. A physical, aggressive and quite ruthless performance from the Rams. There's plenty to discuss from a tactical perspective, but in the most general terms, I thought it was so professional. That's now 20 clean sheets for the season, the best in the division and the highest points tally ever accumulated by a Derby County team. Let's talk about Leighton Orient for a second. It screamed of a tired display and one thing you can't be when you face a Derby County team is unable to compete physically. A poor dual success rate, a low block that struggled to offer an attacking threat and some terrible defending from set pieces. It was a, a learning curve, a quite brutal learning curve at times for a young squad if we're being totally frank. 
The graph shows one-way traffic and Derby started strong. They managed the game in full poor worn fashion. Derby's work defensively limited Leighton Orient to very brief moments going forward with the away side failing to accumulate a single big chance, a very low expected goals and not even a single shot on goal. As always, Paul Warren gave us so much information from his post-match interview and actually admitted his team selection was based on the opposition's weaknesses from set pieces. Sonny Bradley came in and converted from two corners. That's now Derby's 21st set play goal, the highest in League One this season. Take a look at this screenshot in front of you. This is Sonny Bradley's first corner, but second corner that Derby County scored on the day. Give Bradley credit. Give Derby County credit, they deserve it, of course, it's their goal. But I've still got a problem with the defending here, I really do. And to have it go against you three times, I think you definitely have to ask questions of the defence. Firstly, the marking is weak, Sonny Bradley is here. And, put his highlight in there, there he is. Hit, I mean, he's actually started about here. Obviously, I can't show you the live move, but he starts in around this position here, the centre of the box, and is able to just drift inside the six-yard box with ease. And then you've got, I think it's, that's Thomas James, who's marking him, and I use the word marking quite quite carefully because I don't really see it too much as, as marking. It's a very loose um, defensive approach on Sonny Bradley here. It's a mismatch physically, six foot four, Sonny Bradley. I think, I mean, we're not going to talk about height here because I'm not um, physically... Uh, <laughs> gifted myself especially in the height department but it is a it is a mismatch i think uh, uh, thomas james is about five foot nine so it's a, a bit of an issue there from a standpoint and, and why that is happening is, is beyond me it was made far too easy he just drifts inside there and all three of the corner balls are, are coming from that similar position if you're going to give derby a corner force them to score a brilliant header not a tap in from a central position or just two meters from the goal line i mean the the, the next sonny bradley corner is converted from this position at the far post and a lot of the corners were going at the far post because it was pretty clear Leighton Orient weren't defending from that position. If you can't win your duels or compete physically, you're making the task virtually impossible. Derby won 23 more duels, doubling Leighton Orient's successful ground wins. Orient's average positions show their low block and how effective they were in causing an issue going forward. The positions also show their attacking hopes hung on the quality of their wide players, but the issue is those players never really got the ball. And Derby's wide centre-backs would just regain possession straight away. Ford had the least number of touches, didn't compete a single successful dribble and lost the most duels on the pitch. As for Derby County, they made the switch to a back three, which worked, I thought, really well. They played with a really wide set of centre-backs with Nelson and Cashin almost operating as full-backs in possession. This stopped any wide threat, but also allowed Derby's wing-backs to stay so advanced, stretch the play and force Orient to run longer distances. And when they looked leggy anyway, that was a perfect tactical approach and it made Leighton Orient's job even harder. Until next time, I've been Jack. This has been the Jack Ward Football Podcast. Hopefully, you've learned something from today. If you have, please make sure you leave a like and subscribe. Give me your thoughts in the comment section down below, and I'll see you very, very soon. Take care.